This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. Good morning and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we are going to be talking about a question I want to throw out to you. Do you think power corrupts? Okay. So that observation has been out there for uh, a long time and, and most people think it's not even worth talking about, of course power corrupts. Um, that's what I hear when I throw that question out to people. But really, the, the, the answer is not quite that simple. And, and I want us to, to talk through it. You know, Abraham Lincoln said something. Um, he was so, so right and knowledgeable. He said, nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character... Give him power. And I think that says a lot. Think about that. Um, you know, at the, at the beginning of this, I said that Lord Acton, he was a 19th century British historian, said absolute power corrupts absolutely. But, but as, we, as we step through that, I, I will say, as I was looking into this, there are so many writings on power and corruption and why it happens or whether or not it does. And and I want us to kind of step through this. And I'd love to hear from you and your experiences as, as we go through this. But I want to talk to you about a few social experiments um, that, that have been done by people all over the world. Um, a lot of the work comes out of of Poland, out of the UK, of course, looking at the way the political systems are set up in those areas, um, also out of China. And, you know, I think the general observations are that power sends, tends to undermine social relationships. Um, it sort of reduces the, the feeling or the need from the powerful to have the perspective of others. Things tend to fall into now their perspective, okay? Also, it seems that... In some cases, compassion goes out of the window. The willingness to maintain close relationships don't seem as necessary when you're in a position of power. And according to some studies um, that were fairly recently done by Galinsky and others, powerful people seem to be more cynical. They tend to undervalue and objectify other people. They just don't think other people are as important as they are. Now, those are broad generalizations. And and at the same time, it does seem that power, there needs to be some position, right? Some people need to be in positions of power so that they can lead. The glue that coordinates things moves shared goals forward. If you don't have someone who's spearheading it, then what do you do? Okay, can you only lead by group? Can it only be done organically? So groups typically follow leaders for coordination to provide structure and to help an organization. You can't have all leaders, can you? So I'm throwing that question out to you. Think about that for a minute. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that it seems that if you have leaders do, and think about it with your your manager or your boss or you as a boss or a manager or a, a, a teacher who even leads a classroom, you know, what you're you're doing is you're trying to manage goal attain, attainment and, and reduce – procrastination. I think some of us um, really enjoy just kind of sitting around, visiting, 
kind of living life. But if you don't have goals and someone who is directing you to, toward those goals, do you really think accomplishments would happen? When you give good people power, perhaps if they have good moral identity and, and really want to do the right stuff, then maybe, maybe power doesn't corrupt. So just to give you a definition of moral identity, it's the degree in, to which you think it's important to be caring, compassionate, fair, generous, and all of that stuff, okay? So if you're a powerful person, but you still feel that it's very important to be caring, compassionate, fair, generous, giving, can people who have all that stay on their moral compass? Can they stick to that? So those are the things that that I think... um, we need to talk about. And and one of the, I'm going to tell you about three different research projects that, that came out of all this and let you just kind of ruminate on that as we're stepping through whether power corrupts, okay? So one um, was done by a social scientist, DeSales, um, and she, she divided individuals, 173 working adults, and 102 undergraduates, and ask them to participate in, in a study about how important ethical um, and moral compass was to them. So they had them do that rating. And then they, were, they took the undergraduates and told them that they shared a pool of 500 points with other people, okay, 500 points, and that they could take anywhere between zero and 10 points for themselves. But the more points they took, the better their odds of winning a $100 lottery. But if they took too many points, um, then what happened is... It blew the lottery up, and it was a tipping point, and nobody could win. It would empty out the lottery. So remember, there were 102 undergraduates. So if they all took 10 points, then they would blow up the lottery, and the the 100-point lottery would go away. So the they also had to write, to, to read a paper about um, moral identity code. And then they had to write about an ordinary day. And then they, had, they took half of those who wrote about an ordinary day, and the other half wrote about power. Well, guess what happened? The participants who'd just written about an ordinary day took about six and a half points. Didn't matter about their moral compass score. But those who had written about something powerful um, grabbed more points if they had a low moral identity code. They grabbed 7.5 points. The ones with the high moral identity code grabbed only 5.5. So one thing she was pointing out is if you talked about power and felt more powerful, perhaps it made you want to be more powerful in the winning and not be equal. The other thing, she looked at that that other group, and in the adult group, she looked at their moral identity code and then their ethical behavior and their innate aggressiveness. And it, it seemed people, that people with a higher moral identity code, were, even though they were assertive people, were less likely to be cheaters when questioned on things. So basically what DeSales decided was that power doesn't corrupt. It just heightens who you already are, what your pre-existing ethical tendencies are. So if you already have a low moral compass, then you're more likely to 
degenerate into someone who's not very caring about other people. Okay, I'm going to tell you about one other thing I want you to ruminate about. So this is a real incident. It was written by someone, a social scientist who, who is a Berkeley professor. He was riding his bike to work. He stopped on his bike in the traffic lane at a four-way stop. And a very large, expensive Mercedes came barreling up, but it was the biker's turn. So he he started to cross through the crossway, but the very expensive Mercedes didn't stop at the four-way stop when he saw the biker. And then he slammed on his brakes, barely missed the prof, and then the driver leaned out of the car and yelled at the biker. Okay? So... (laughs) <laughs> this professor was infuriated. It was his right of way, but this very expensive Mercedes thought that he thought, the professor said, he was infuriated. He thought this person just felt privileged. So then he calmed down and he said, you know, I'm going to do an experiment. So he sent out a group of students to monitor with clipboards um, around traffic islands at Berkeley. And they monitored the vehicle etiquette at, at the junctions and kept notes on the models and makes. And what they observed was, and, and they also observed who allowed pedestrians their right of way at the street crossings, um, who pretended not to see them. And um, so the results were pretty clear and kind of sad that Mercedes drivers, Um, and other expensive car drivers, let's not just target Mercedes, I'll say that, were 25% as likely to stop at a crossing and four times more likely to cut in front of another car than drivers of old beaten up Ford Pintos and Dodge Colts. The more luxurious the vehicle, the more entitled the owner felt to violate the laws. Seems like that'd be in the opposite. Like the more fancy and expensive a car you have, the more you would not be aggressive in traffic. You would think that to protect your car. Uh, Maybe that's a guy who's never had a fancy car talking about how he would treat his fancy car. That may be so, Jay. (laughs) Because that's more perspective, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. it really, it really is another perspective. But, but at least in Southern California at Berkeley, um, they. What they found was that apparently, and this was the professor's interpretation, that these were rich people who felt more powerful and more entitled. So um, that's kind of sad, right? Uh, Because you would hope that people with means and money would be more willing to help other people out. Well, when you were setting that up, the first thing I thought to myself is, I wonder where she's going. Is it it going to turn out that it being a Mercedes had nothing to do with it at all. And that, you know, why did we just assume that this guy was a jerk in traffic because he's driving a Mercedes? I thought that might be where you're going you to were set hoping that, up. that, right? But no, then it just turns out, you know, he was he was a guy that was, you know, or I guess more people are apt to be like that when they're driving a more expensive car. And that might even be subconscious because I think most of those people would be like, if you asked them, hey, why are you driving so reckless? In your fancy vehicle, they'd be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I should be more careful. Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe people, you little people, get out of my way. Is that what's Well, that is could that be a whole happening? lot of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, certainly I know this is election time and, and we're in the political arena right now. And so we can talk about does being in the power of a political office corrupt. But, you know, I think it's in, in all areas of life. Um, did you find that a friend who got elevated into a position of power, whether it was managerial or the CEO or the CFO of an organization, did you find that they changed? Do you think that power changes you and and makes you perhaps not as um, aware of other people and as sensitive and empathetic? So today we're talking about power. Does power corrupt? Perhaps, but maybe it doesn't corrupt everyone. Um, 
And, you know, it does seem, though, that many people who take a position of power do change. And I have a few more examples for you. But before we get to that, let's let's go to the phones. We have Stanley in Starkville. Hi, Stanley. Hello. How are y'all doing? Great. Thanks for calling and joining in the conversation. All right. Well, uh, the paradigm power corrupts. I've always thought it was not quite right. And this goes back to something I read when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the, uh, I've always thought that it shouldn't be power corrupts, but that power attracts the corruptible. It's a subtle distinction, Ooh. but I think it's important. Wow. Um, that kind of, kind of reverse the order of things there. Yeah. Um, I, I think you may have a bit of a point. Again, I, 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 broad generalizations are bad. And we know that there have been some very great and wonderful people who have been elevated to positions of power who have done some great stuff, right? Yes, ma'am. But, but we also know that there have been a lot of people that have attracted, been attracted by power that have done terrible things. Yeah, yep. And and I, I I would love to hear from others about that because actually there was a, a experiment done back in 1971 by social psychologists who who thought that they were demonstrating that that power corrupts um, from a Stanford prison simulation experiment that they did where. They took volunteers who were randomly assigned to play the role of prisoners or prison guards. And as the day passed on, it was observed that the students who were given the role of prison guards became sadistic. They were they subjugated the prisoners. They were cruel. They take their clothes away, force them to sleep on concrete floors. I mean, it it really degenerated into barbaric behavior against the prisoners in this simulated situation. And they aborted the experiment because the researchers got so upset about it. And so, you know, they were looking, well, power does corrupt. But then what they went back to, to look at it and revisited the Stanford prison experience is, could the participants have self-selected um, themselves, those who wanted to be have power over others and subjugate others, um, they because in that particular experiment done at Stanford, they let them self select whether they were the prisoners or the prison guards, and exactly. yeah, and so um, were those prison guards were those individuals who self selected to be the prison guards, the people who re- really felt they needed power over others, so or wanted it, right? Wanted power over others. It does in in looking at power and the corruptible people in power. Many times it does seem through some of the research that I've read that individuals who are not who are not comfortable in their own skin, who are not comfortable in who they are, tend to try to elevate their feelings through gaining power. That happens sometimes. Not yes, always. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Now, another place where uh, uh, this is studied very, very closely is within the military. Mm. Because if you've got an, uh, uh, an officer or an NCO that is a leader and he has power, and think about what that means when you've got power in a military situation, uh, they're they're very watchful about who gets put into those positions of power, and the higher you get in the hierarchy, uh, the more you're uh, uh, subjected to uh, watch. Really? Yes, ma'am. 
That's that's very interesting, and I I do believe that that many times individuals who are elevated in power, if if they don't have the right moral compass, can indeed fall into negative behavior that that's honestly terrible. So I'd like to hear from others. What do you think? Thank you, Stanley, so much for for giving us a call and starting us off because you really did hit on a point. Sometimes it's self-selection. So, Jay, you had a couple of questions as we were in the break. And well, I don't know. As fir- first, as you laid that scenario out, it made me think, first off, is if if I'm the leaders of the prison— as soon as the self-selectors as guards start acting out, I'm like, well, what what action is being exhibit, exhibited before them by our actual guards? Why are they why are they so keen to act out when they're in that position? Is that what's being done in front of them? Is this a is this like is this a, like a revenge ish type of mimicking of the behavior that they they're shown every day? But that's not what the topic of the show was. So. Uh, that's neither here nor there. I guess it's more there than here. But the other thing is at the at the beginning of the show, you started talking about morals and ethics. And I want right. we hear about those things all the time. And we know they live generally in the same neighborhood, but they do not live in the same house. Right. What is draw us a line between morals and ethics? OK, well, that, that. <laughs> I know that's a is really big answer for a simple question. That is a big answer. And it's something that I think. Um, as as we talked about morals, um, that is just how how intrinsically you you treat others. Your your moral compass is is your compassion, your ability to put others before you, and so ethics. If you look at it, it's it's actual moral principles that govern a person's behavior, so or governs their activity. So there's a lot of crossover. Um, ethics ethics are those principles that govern you, but morality is embedded within it, and so um, you know, it's it's part ethics is part of those moral principles. I don't I don't know if I answered. Your question. You gave me your opinion, so that's what counts. But, I asked you. So yeah. The other thing is, I think uh, Stanley from Starkville made a, a decent point that, I, and and it's it's always going to be kind of a, a sliding scale, but I think uh, you know politics or leadership. I don't think it didn't start with corruption. No. And I I think corruption tends to find a way to loosen the rules or move the line to cross further and further and further and further to whatever direction they want to move it to. And I think the, the, the more in everybody's face this happens, but nothing changes, the more it invites more people to want to take part in that. Yeah. Because, you know, I, like, I, I am, a, I am a, a huge agitator of our country's political duopoly. It is ruining our country. Yeah. It is quite plain to see. Yeah, we've had some good conversations about that. But we all continue to vote for one of the two parties. And when the worst of the two can only be the backup quarterback, right, who's the most popular guy on the team when it's not running well? The backup quarterback, you know. So to me, that's like the way that, at least in our country, the way it's all set up invites people to bring their friends in. It's It's not even like finding a way to get involved with it. It's probably like people want to bring their, hey man, look at this honey pot we found over here where we could just bend and break the rules to work more and more to our advantage, you know, and create like this political class that we continue to do in our country. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing me in, dog. And, you know, that's where it comes from. Yeah. At least in my opinion. Well, back to Lord Acton's statement way back as absolute power absolutely corrupts. I, I think what you don't want is is someone having absolute or anyone, any one group having absolute power um, so that they have to be blind to, to others or deaf uh, to others. So... So it's like this. So we have a, a, a former governor, a recent former governor who is in a lot of hot water right now for some stuff he's done with a volleyball court and a 
Southern Miss quarterback and all this kind of stuff. If the statewide elections this evening are swept by that party, what are we as a people saying about our ethics or morals? Did we just turn a blind eye to some alleged rampant corruption and go ahead and keep electing that guy's friends? Mm -hmm. Or do you hold that party accountable? Or because there's only two parties, is it so that we can't afford to let the other people run, even though we have people who are, you know, talking out the side of their neck in public, you know? Good questions thrown out there. All right, let's go back to the phones. I'd love to hear what other people think, too. And and we'll come back around to some of that, Jay. Um, Danny, let's start with Danny in Tupelo. Danny, you're asking what the definition of power is? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super intrigued by the conversation. And, and uh, I, I guess kind of my standpoint or viewpoint was, was what are what is it that we are exactly considering uh, a position of power. Uh, I mean, if we're determining that from um, you're the editor or the author of a magazine versus you're in law enforcement versus you're a business owner, what what in this scenario constitutes power? Well, that's a really good question because, you know, power is basically the ability to influence the behavior of others or to direct the behavior of others. So if we if we take it just for those words, um, if if you can influence others, in my mind, that means that that doesn't necessarily mean you're controlling them. If you direct them, then that's a bit more of a control word to me. Um, and so I guess it's how we we define power. Um, now, absolute power to me would mean that you not only influence, but you direct, you tell people what to do, and they don't have a say in, in um, it. And so... Again, your point, Danny, is you know if it's it's if it's an um, an editor of a of a, a paper, or uh, uh, versus a, a CEO, um, what what's the difference there? And I think it depends on the structure of the organization, because I know in the structure of some organizations, the president or the director. Um, is it will of the board? And so there's not absolute power there. Um, but in some cases, it's not that at all. And it's all at will of that executive director. So I think it depends on the structure. You're absolutely right. I don't know. I Did, think I, all those things you mentioned are, are, are examples of where power can be corrupted. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, in a journal, um, I know in um, one of our pediatric journals for a while, there was there even even a pediatric journal. There there had been some issues that were ongoing as to whose articles got in and whose didn't and and such as that. So, yeah, fair fair enough. Fair enough. So I guess I guess my takeaway from everything and, and, and the general point of my question and in trying to establish what 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 that looked like. I guess my argument or position on whether or not um, power is equated with corruption, I, I would lean towards my experience with law enforcement. And I would say that despite the, the media portrayal of every bad officer and, and every bad incident and all the sensationalization of, of everything that doesn't work out the way that we would like it to, I would think that those are all men and women in a position of power who are literally – answering millions of calls of service a day in which nothing goes wrong and everything goes as it should. Those aren't the stories that you hear about or the things that are right. front and center. They don't call attention to that. They're, they're, not, they're not paraded for uh, or sensationalized for doing what they should be doing anyway. But just from a numerical standpoint of encounters with public and people that go correctly versus those that don't the the numbers that go correctly just vastly and grossly outweigh the ones that don't so i guess my position would be if if power equated to corruption 
then those numbers wouldn't look like that. Uh, Danny, I think you have a great point about our police officers and and in in almost every incident when you have people in the service industry like that um, you hear about you only hear about the bad sadly many times and i'm always heartened when i when the the news media um you hear it on television and radio sometimes um about those really wonderful things that an officer did like um, the the little acts of kindness that have happened that'll bring you to tears, but we don't hear about them because they're not sensational. So you're right, and I I do think that in general, people in power are not corruptible, but some are, and I think that's that's where that moral compass, who you are. To start with, although I will say that there are some people perhaps who are in general pretty good people, but were corrupted by something that Rachel from Eupora wants to talk about. So I want to get to her call next. Danny, thanks for your call. Rachel, you have a comment about um, power and what what causes the yeah, corruption. Uh So I'm wondering how big a role money plays Mm -hmm. in uh, this thing of power and corruption. I know three people, and I will say that they were, uh, I was a part of their lives and they were a part of my life, who uh, once they got in a position uh, of power, the money uh, came rolling in, and they began to feel entitled. Uh, they began to forget about uh, how other people's lives might uh, matter. One was a plant manager. One was a uh, an assistant to the plant manager. And one was actually a doctor. And the doctor actually felt like it was his right, and he said so, at least that's what somebody told me. Somebody told me that he had said that he didn't try uh, to cure old people. He just wanted to see how much radiation they could sustain. Uh, And that's what turned out to happen. He was actually uh, arrested in um, in a situation where he had hired somebody to kill somebody. Uh, well, okay, Rachel, that that is clearly just a very bad person who was uh-huh. in a position of power, which I think is a good demonstration that, you know, you can be, you can be very bright and you can have money and still be a very evil person. So, yeah, um, I, I, money can corrupt um, if... If you don't have a good moral compass, again, it all boils down to what Jay and I were talking about, that sort of that set of ethics that you have, that list of what is right and wrong, um, how much you care about other people, um, whether or not you stop seeing people once you have plenty of money. And, And certainly... Um, there are people out there, and I'm sure you know some, who 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 were friendly and wonderful people, and suddenly they came into a lot of wealth and turned into somebody very different. And that happens often. And um, so why do people lose sort of their moral compass and their empathy and caring for others when they come into money? That's a good question. You know, we were talking about the $1.9 billion lottery before the radio show, and I said, why don't they just have 1,900 people who win a million dollars instead of one person who wins $1.9 billion? And that way we'd have people with enough money to be comfortable, but not that those hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to to end up unhappy because that's what happens often. I don't know. 
I'll stop there, Rachel. Um, <laughs> Interesting topic. I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Okay, we're going to stay on the phone. So we have Teresa who's been waiting in Hattiesburg. Hi, Teresa. Hi, how are you? Good. Tell us what your thoughts are about power and corruption. Well, you kind of, Rachel, and you just kind of covered what I was um, just, my thoughts. Um, but um, one was the one was that um, I was wondering how the circle of, acquaintances or friends or relationships, how that changes as people um, acquire power, how that might influence um, their, um, their behaviors um, as they acquire power. If they have a, a different circle of acquaintances and friends, that might change them. And also as they acquire money, how that might change them. So I was thinking that there's probably a complex interaction of factors. Um, that might play into someone becoming corrupted or corruptible. Right, right. And I, I do, I, I, I think you're, you're right. And I can think of a few instances where individuals um, came into money, either because they were working hard and made a lot of money and then suddenly had power, um, who who then began to do the wrong thing, even though they didn't set out to do the wrong thing. So, yeah, there's a, a quote from Andy Fasto, who was the former CFO of Enron. Enron, remember that one. He said, I didn't set out to commit a crime. I certainly didn't set out to hurt anyone. When I was working at Enron, you know, I was kind of a hero because I helped the company company make its numbers every quarter, and I thought I was going to do a good thing. I thought I was smart, but I wasn't. And I guess people sometimes can get so caught up into making money and climbing the ladder, and whether it's the latter to become a CEO or the la- the social ladder, um, people get so enthralled with that, then they forget who they're about. Um, I just don't think everybody who gets into power, who makes mistakes, has no moral compass. That I, I would hate to say that because I. That can't be, there can't be, um, that can't be all the reason. I think sometimes the pressures and the temptations get to us. And when we're in a position of power, we forget that perhaps other people are looking. I don't know. I don't know. Teresa, do you have a thought about that? Well, I'm just thinking that as you, as a person acquires power, also, a lot of times wealth comes with that, and then your social circle changes. Yeah. And when your social circle changes, you have a different um, comparisons. You're making different comparisons and judgments, like the head of the man you just talked about at Enron. He was trying to please his superiors and, and his company and, and his stockholders and stuff. It was a different circle of people that he was trying to, you know, Right, and so you're influenced, and so those influences put pressure on you. And the same thing happens in social groups. What happens is you get in a social group, and, and everybody is dressing a certain way, talking a certain way, and associating with certain people, and not others. And often... What happens is all that association, you lose a sense of true reality, Um, what the, quote, common people are dealing with. And um, and, and I I do think what happens is some some people just perhaps lose their direction because they're they're they float up to the top and they start thinking they're better. So. I don't know. Let's stay on the phones. We have uh, two other callers that I want to make sure we get to. Um, Ela is in Memphis. Hey, Ela. 
Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I love these conversations. I'm assuming that we're talking about power and corruption because of, you know, the um, the voting and everything. Mm-hmm. And so I have two statements to make if that's okay. Sure. Uh, one is that as a, you know, our civic duty that does not and should not end at voting. And I feel like not holding those folks that we vote for accountable for what we had hoped they would do or what they said they were going to do is part of the downfall. Um, You let loose a kid in a candy store and by human nature, not because they're morally, you know, corrupt, they want something of everything. So I think that, you know, we, we should know ourselves better and kind of keep checks and balances, uh, and I don't mean that as a reference to the government, but checks and balances as in people um, in place uh, and and kind of um, hold people accountable. So that's one thing. And the other is, as a leader, um, generally we're not born as a leader, so at some point you take the lead, and um, hopefully your hope is or should be that that first person that decides, you know, you're okay, I think I'll follow you. Oh, her phone dropped out. Uh-oh. Oh, shoot. Um, I I think, let me just repeat one thing that she said. I'm so sorry we lost you because I, I heard the point you were making. But what I want to emphasize, and it's something that, Jay, you brought up, was that um, – was that the accountability factor. Sometimes we think we vote, but then we forget to hold people accountable. And so to make sure that if we put someone in office um, or if we have someone in in an area of leadership and they don't do the job that they were supposed to do and they're not being accountable, then perhaps we shouldn't vote for them again or perhaps we should make sure that we hold those individuals accountable. Okay, we're going to get to one more caller. We're going to go on to Johnny in Brookhaven. We're having such great conversation. Hey, Johnny. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, I just wanted to say we, um, I guess this goes without saying, we can't rely solely on the goodwill of our leaders, um, you know, to do the right thing. You know, again, like the previous caller, we need strong regulation, strong checks and balances upon our leaders. To make sure they do the right thing because um, it looks like when they get into high positions, it's easy to do the wrong thing. It's not to say that they would choose that, but, you know, a lot of times you need guidance. And uh, a lot of times people don't like that word regulation. But in order to, to keep a lot of this corruption from happening, we, we need strong safeguards and everything, too. Um, I think one one of the things we have to really think about is what the cost of corruption is. And I've seen it with my own eyes in state government. And uh, it's what it's what's part. It's not the total thing, but you know, it greatly is at the center of what makes us the 51st state. Mm. And uh, it causes the deaths of people. I've seen it because when you're corrupt, you rob resources from people that would otherwise go for the care of people, and it's just immoral. But yeah. yet these kind of people, they, they're appointed or voted in, and there's not much you can do. So that's why, again, you need strong regulation and safeguards. And uh, and one other thing, I'll just end with this, too. Uh, I saw a quote one time. I, I love it. And uh, it says, education, the obligation of youth, the safeguard of the republic, education, the safe, the ob- obligation of youth, the safeguard of the republic, which is to say, you know, unless we educate ourselves on all the issues needed, you know, to, to keep ourselves going, you know, we'll lose our republic, mm. become an authoritarian state, and one only need look to Nazi Germany and those kind of civilizations to really look at some horrors that can happen to to follow leaders blind blindly and to say uh yeah this guy has all the answers you know no complex issues take a complex approach they do uh, thanks for 
Thanks for letting me ramble. Oh, no, you didn't. And and you made some good <laughs> points. Thank you, Johnny. I, I think that, yeah, the point is, is that you've got to have checks and balances. You can't have absolute power. You have to have individuals who are accountable. So I appreciate I appreciate you calling and talking about that. And, and you know, being informed, obviously, is important. Okay, Ela called back, and then we have a call from Lewis. So, Ela, you had another point you wanted to finish? I'm sorry, yes. That's okay. Um, actually, I, I, my point just evolved. Um, you know, we have codified law. We have free choice. And right in between, in the gray area, is ethics and standards, social um, standards. And I think, you know, we can't, obviously, we cannot impose our standards on on the other people. However, there are social standards that are present, and that's the gray area. Yeah. So the, another problem comes in where the people that we put in power are making laws about regulating themselves. Good luck with that. Yeah. You know, like you're talking about term limits. Well, these are the same folks that are supposed to be voting on whether they should have term limits or not. Well, obviously, they're not going to vote against themselves. Well, that, you know? yeah, I think that that happens in every organization on every board. Um, and so that's when you've got to have a good moral compass. We've got to elect people who really are going to stay true. And if they don't, as you said at the beginning, we need to hold them accountable. So I, I think that's so important. Thank you, Ela, for that. Okay, let's go to our final caller, Lewis in Mobile. Hi, Lewis. Thanks for calling. Thanks for talking to me. Um, so I guess my point is kind of uh, in line with the last two comments. Um, as the saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, so how do we keep people from having absolute power? That's where accountability comes in. Right. I don't think anyone... Uh, goes into um, a, a position of power, let's say Congress or Senate, with the intention of defrauding the people. They go in because they want to make a change, but somewhere along the line, they did something that was not above the law, um, or it was not above it was above the law, or it was out of line with the law, and it was something some small infraction, and they got away with it. And then the next time that came up, they thought, well, I got away with it last time. Mm-hmm. Let me do it again. Mm-hmm. And it just snowballs. And if they are not held accountable, it just completely gets out of hand to, to the point to where we have someone in power who is no longer the person that was elected. And it's just out of control. Right. So – they're not the person that you thought you had elected. They're, they've turned into someone who is not holding up um, the values that you had voted that person in for. And I think that – I know this has gone to talking more about elected officials rather than other people in power, but I think it all stands um, basically the same – as as you're saying, many most people don't go into office thinking, oh, I'm going to be corrupt and I'm going to do something terrible. Of course they don't. But what happens is the, the pressures um, seem in some cases to overweigh and the rewards that adrenaline rush you get from that risk taking and that thinking, oh, I got away with a little bit. Now maybe I can get away with a little more. Um, just overrides the true sensibility and and morality of that individual. So again, to make sure that that wherever we are in whatever position of power we are, that we make sure that we we try to hold true to our ethics and morals, and that we also expect others in leadership above us to do the same. So thank you. This was a wonderful discussion, I thought. And, and, you know, again, hopefully power doesn't 
corrupt. But if you'd like to hear this show all the way through or again, any past episodes, go to the podcast um, on your favorite podcast app. Just search Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. And next week, we're going to talk about social norms, what determines them and why. How do they change us? How can they be incorrect? So we want to talk about that some, okay? So thanks, everybody. Thank you, callers. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio. Um, My producer, Jay White, engineered the show. Charles Arnold was our call screener. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I really hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone.